Right, as Mary said, we're four weeks into an Ephesians sermon series, which we're going to suspend after this week and then pick up again in future school holidays. Last week, if you remember, we asked, how do we know God? Which we answered by defining knowledge of God as encounter with love and saying that we come to know God more in the heart than the head. We know God by meeting God in the depths of our being, which is why we have received the Holy Spirit, God's personal presence and power, to enlighten the eyes of the heart, in the words of Paul, with a revelation of God's love. The head plays a part, but it's not primary. It's the Holy Spirit meeting our human spirit with divine love and grace that truly reveals to us who God is. This week, we explore what it means to become like Christ, and we ask the question, how do we change? In other words, how do we live holy lives, think holy thoughts, and embody a holy God? In some ways, the answer should be obvious following on from last week, because the dynamics of human transformation as followers of Jesus mirror the the dynamics of how we know God. If moral and spiritual transformation flows from knowledge of God, and it largely does, and true knowledge of God is about encountering God's love, then it follows that it's God's love and God's power at work within us that changes us, not our best efforts to change ourselves. And that's really the heart of today's message. It's God's love that effectively moves us, drawing us into a journey of sanctification, purifying our hearts and minds and habits of life. It's the Spirit of God at work within us and our submission to the activity of the Holy Spirit more than our own striving attempts to change. And it's certainly not fear or shame or guilt that motivates us to model Christ in our lives. Fear, shame, and guilt are dreadful motivators. Rather, it's an inner awareness of God's loving, peaceful presence leading us into Christ-like obedience. Now, we do play a part, and I'm going to say something on this today. We can choose to resist or submit to God's loving actions within us. So we're not merely passive recipients of moral transformation. It doesn't just automatically happen to us through God's actions. We are, in fact, quite active agents in the whole purification process. But our activity, based on what we know of how we grow in knowledge of God, is largely the activity of yielding to God's fiercely refining love and then partnering with the Holy Spirit who works to conform our life to the life of Christ. And that's a very different process to how some believers envision and approach Christian discipleship and personal sanctification. Too many of us, I suggest, are busy trying to clean ourselves up in the hope of being pleasing to God. But we're attempting to do something that only God can do through his own power and love, and we're misunderstanding the nature of grace, God's unconditional love for us that leads us on that journey of sanctification. We are trying to bring life to ourselves, and to put it very simply, the dead can't do that. The dead can't bring themselves to life. Listen again to how Paul speaks of our state before God gets a hold of us. You were dead through the trespasses and sins in which you once lived, following the course of this world, following the ruler of the power of the air, the spirit that is now at work among those who are disobedient. Elsewhere in Ephesians, he says, For once you were darkness, but now in the Lord you are light. Darkness and death, that was our state prior to coming to Christ. Without life 
and without light. Now, that's not to say there was no moral good in us, any more than it is to say that we are now spotless saints. We were never wholly evil, and we're not now wholly good. Paul's point in using absolutes of light and dark, life and death, is to starkly contrast our old life without the hope of salvation through Christ, with our new life in Christ, filled with hope and the promise of the resurrection, and yes, also the promise and the power to live a holy life that pleases God. Paul wants to make it very clear that we didn't have a hope of saving ourselves, and that the devil had a hold on our old life, and has a hold on the bits of our old life that still have a hold on us. It is God's mercy, not our merits, that brings us to life in Christ and maintains that life in Christ. And before God brings us to life, we were thoroughly dead and under judgment. Now, the notion of divine judgment is not very popular today. And some of us might like to skip over it. It all sounds a bit much like the kind of an angry God that we'd rather not envision or publicly represent. But we cannot comprehend divine love and mercy without taking seriously divine justice and anger towards human sinfulness. They are two sides of the same holy God. Paul has no trouble speaking about these things. In fact, he uses language that makes us squirm with our modern sensibilities. We were, by nature, children of wrath, like everyone else, he says. That was our status prior to salvation. Like it or not, God detests sin and sentences sinners, which we all were, and the sentence of sin is death. But this is simply another way of saying that there were many dimensions of our old life that harmed ourselves and others and God's good creation and breached our relationship with God, all of which stifled and suppressed life and spread death. Human beings nurture within their own hearts selfishness and pride, hatred and malice, idolatry and self-deception, and defiant independence of God. We are masters at avoiding God and seeking to establish ourselves as mini-gods, answering to no one except ourselves. So it's not so much that a grumpy God woke up one day filled with wrath and vengeance and said to himself, I think I'll condemn all of humanity. Rather, I suggest God patiently watches humanity's determined efforts to go it alone, sowing death and destruction in innumerable ways. And God sees where all this blind rebellion leads, away from life. So don't blame God for the sentence of death that hangs over humanity. We are morally and spiritually responsible for our own allegiance with the powers of darkness. We have sold ourselves into sinful slavery. That's the bad news. How are you doing? The remarkable good news of the gospel is that God intervened in our determined efforts to self-destruct. Paul writes, but God, who is rich in mercy, out of the great love with which he loved us, even when we were dead through our trespasses, made us alive together with Christ. So much for the image of a God who enjoys sentencing sinners to death. God doesn't. Mercy triumphs over judgment. Love, not wrath, most deeply defines God. We can't entirely cull the word wrath from our biblical vocabulary, nor should we, but we should see God's anger as massively overshadowed by his merciful and extravagant love. When Yahweh introduced himself to Moses at Mount Sinai, he announced, the Lord, the Lord, A God merciful and gracious, 
slow to anger and abounding in steadfast love and faithfulness. God's LinkedIn profile begins with this glorious self-description. God saves because he loves. He lifts the sentence of sin and death and breathes life into dead persons. And this is the point we really want to grasp today. God brings to life that which is thoroughly dead. Paul puts this very clearly and plainly by saying, even when we were dead through our trespasses, God made us alive together with Christ. God made us alive. Who's the active agent of our salvation there? God. It's all of God. God is the sole agent of our salvation, our spiritual awakening. We played no part in that awakening. How could we? We were dead. And the same power that raised Christ from the dead awakened us. The life we have been given in Christ is pure gift from God. And in one sense, every dimension of it comes from God, not from us. We will come to our participation in salvation in a moment. But first, we're establishing a basic biblical fact. God saves us on his own. And Paul takes great pains to stress this by saying, By grace you have been saved. And God raised us up with him, Christ, and seated us with him in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus. And then, because he wants to say it again, just two verses later he says, For by grace you have been saved, through faith. And this is not your own doing. It is the gift of God, not the result of work, so that no one may boast. So it's clearly all of God. As the great Protestant reformers once stressed over against a Catholic church that seemed to be a little hazy, on the relationship of grace, faith, good works, and salvation. God's grace alone has saved us. Now, most of us would readily admit this when it comes to seeing how we first came to faith in Christ. But it's the ongoing journey of faith that I think we get a little confused over. If it's all somehow of God, what's our part? And though we may know that our good works don't save us, how do we still learn to do them? After all, they seem important to Paul, who writes, For we are what he has made us, created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand to be our way of life. And so, we are rightly eager to know how to cultivate a life of good works because if we're honest with ourselves, we know that we're not all light and life and purity yet. Despite God's grace bringing us to life in Christ, there remains dark and dead corners within us, defying and competing with the life and light of God. Paul is not ignorant of this fact. After saying unequivocally, for once you were darkness, but now in the Lord you are light, he goes on to immediately exhort the Ephesian believers to live as children of light. For the fruit of the light is found in all that is good and right and true. Try to find out what is pleasing to the Lord. Just think about it. He wouldn't have to say this if they were already fully sanctified. Clearly, The Ephesian believers were not always radiant with light and humming with holiness. Do we identify? So then, how do we change? I think the answer to that question, as I hinted earlier, is quite simple in a sense. What is true of how we came to faith remains true of how we progress in faith and learn to live in a way that pleases God. If you're first saved by God's grace and mercy and extraordinary power while in a state of complete powerlessness, then guess how you go on being sanctified, transformed, and purified. The same way you began, 
by admitting your utter helplessness to overcome sin and throwing yourself on the grace and mercy of God to help you live in the light. God's grace, power, and love is needed to sanctify you in the same way that it first saved you. Is this making sense? This principle is a key to Christian discipleship, I believe, and it's so often overlooked or misunderstood by believers who struggle to reform and renew themselves and wonder why it doesn't work. The power to live the Christian life, the new life we have in Christ, is as much a gift from God, and it didn't cease to be God's power and suddenly belong to us at some point after conversion. It remains God's power and must be God's power at work within us, fueling our new life in Christ. You and I do not have the power to change ourselves. What then do we do? What's our part? Our part, I think, is to exercise humility and faith. Our part is to humbly ask God to help and continue to believe in the gracious, saving power of God. Our part is to remain open to God and pay attention to the work of the Holy Spirit within us because as with knowledge of God, so too with Christ-likeness, it all flows from an ongoing encounter with a loving God in the core of our being. And Paul captures the spiritual principle very succinctly with his prayer for the Ephesians. He says, I pray that, according to the riches of his glory, he may grant that you may be strengthened in your inner being with power through the Spirit, and that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith as you are being rooted and grounded in love. Now, we examined this verse last week with respect to knowledge and love. Let's now look at it with respect to holiness and human transformation. To have Christ dwell in our hearts through faith and to be progressively rooted and grounded in love, experientially meeting God that is to change. That prompts change within us. But consider for a moment how that change takes place. If Christ likeness is the end goal, then don't miss the fact that the means properly fits the end. It's Christ dwelling in us through faith that creates Christ likeness in our life and conduct our thoughts and actions. I hope this is making sense. Remember last week, I said knowledge of God is not abstract. Rather, it's encounter with the person of God. In the same way, formation as Christians into Christ-like persons is not something that happens aside from communion with Christ. Communion with Christ is the only way it happens. And that communion takes place in the core of our being through the presence and power of the Holy Spirit. And so that is where our focus needs to be as believers called to live holy lives. Focus on meeting with Christ and the Spirit, not on trying to change yourself. There is a subtle but significant difference to those two approaches to Christian holiness. Now, I want to recruit Christian psychologist and theologian John Coe to help us understand just how misguided it is to try to morally reform ourselves as believers and human beings. Coe contrasts our attempts at moral formation with genuine spiritual formation. Bear with me, this is a little bit complex. Spiritual formation, he says, is something deeper. Spiritual formation results in moral transformation, but it pays attention to the activity of the Holy Spirit in our life rather than focus on the moral issues that we want to change. The spiritual life is about knowing and partnering with God who can and does transform us, 
It is not a concerted attempt to purify ourselves and please God with our best efforts. Such moral attempts degenerate very quickly, says Coe, into moral legalism. And that is exactly what Paul challenged the Galatian believers over. Life in Christ has moral implications, to be sure, but it's much more than moral behavior modification, and that's what some of us are trying to do. And that's a trap, because if we, if we lose sight of Christ and are attempting to change ourselves, one, we fail, two, we're trying to do the work of Christ in our own life. I'll let Co explain in his own words. The moral temptation, he says, is the attempt to deal with our own spiritual failure, guilt, and shame by means of spiritual efforts, by attempting to perfect oneself in the power of the self. It is the attempt of the well-intentioned believer to use spiritual formation, spiritual disciplines, ministry, service, obedience, being good in general, as a way to relieve the burden of spiritual failure, lack of love, and the guilt and shame that results. It is the temptation to try to relieve a burden that Christ alone can relieve. The great danger of moralism, says Coe, is simply that it seeks to avoid the cross of Christ and the power of the Spirit, the very means of spiritual formation and moral transformation. We're trying to do God's work in us, ourselves, without coming to God. Coe speaks of attempting to perfect oneself in the power of the self. The subtle temptation when it comes to sanctification is the attempt to live a holy life without turning to a holy God. And as a psychologist, Coe is acutely aware that we try to shift feelings of guilt and shame. We are aware of our spiritual and moral failures, and we seek to relieve that burden. Coe makes it clear that when we do this through a concerted effort to tick all the boxes of a good Christian life, rather than turn to Christ, we are actually bypassing the means of our salvation. It is the temptation, says Co, to try to relieve a burden that Christ alone can relieve. Now, we've probably all done this, so don't beat yourself up. But can you see how subtly misguided it is? Paul is clear that the power of the Christian life belongs to God, not to us. He speaks of the immeasurable greatness of his power for us who believe, according to the working of his great power. The key to the Christian life is to access the power of God, not pretend we have the power within ourselves to live in any way that is pleasing to God. In contrast to the futile and moralistic attempts at cleaning up our own lives, co-paints an inspiring picture of a Christian maturity that looks to Christ and, and clings to him. He writes, As we grow older in faith, we discover that the Christian life is more about Christ and less about our efforts. It is about what he has done and about our life in Christ and how to open the heart to this new covenant life dependent on the Spirit. This is an obedience of abiding in the vine, an opening to the life of God within. It is an obedience, but not one of moralism. In fact, true obedience is a movement away from moralism to an obedience of trust that opens to another person to live through us based on the work of the cross of Christ. Paul can say of himself, it is no longer I who live, but it is Christ who lives in me. Paul remained aware of his imperfections, but he knew that the Christian life is Christ's life within us, not our futile efforts to live like Christ. Can you see and sense the difference? In Jesus' own words, I am the vine, 
you are the branches. Those who abide in me and I in them bear much fruit, because apart from me, you can do nothing. Today's message is a simple invitation to throw yourself back on God if you've been struggling away, trying to transform yourself with a growing sense of your own powerlessness to change. The grace, the power, the love of God that transforms us is there waiting for us in Christ Jesus, awaiting our realization again that only God can save us and go on saving us. Only God can breathe life into the dead corners of our life. And so in the most pastoral of ways, I want to say to us today, let's stop trying to change ourselves. And some of us, myself included, may want to say to God today, Lord, see the broken and dark places of my life. See the sin that still clings to me. Have mercy on me, God. Forgive me for struggling on my own and not turning to your love. I've tried to heal myself but can't. I tried to live a holy life and failed. I surrender the struggle to you. Help me hear your voice whispering words of hope and life. Show me again the unconditional love of Christ who went to the cross for me. Strengthen me in my inner being with power through your Holy Spirit so that I am rooted and grounded again in your love. And teach me to love and obey you. I want to invite us all now to read those words. I want to invite you to read them silently and make them your own if they resonate with you. Modify them if you feel to. As you privately pray, Surrender the struggle to make yourself holy and welcome the Holy Spirit of God who makes all things new. We're going to spend a moment now in quiet prayer. Heavenly Father, we acknowledge again our complete dependence on you for every aspect of our salvation, including our sanctification, our calling to live like your son Jesus. Help us humbly open our lives to your transforming love and allow the power of your Spirit to change us in ways that we cannot change ourselves, Lord. Teach us not to struggle away on our own. Help us turn to you frequently and confidently in the knowledge that you love us unconditionally. And as we open our hearts to you in faith, sanctify our lives, Lord, for our good and for your glory. Amen.